Right, good morning everybody. Welcome to day two of B-Sides Las Vegas. Woo! <laughs> okay, so before getting started, I just want to make some announcements. Make sure your phone is on silent and we'll have Q&A towards the end, so I'll walk around with the mic. And yeah, let's jump right into it. So the title of the talk is Cyber Crash Investigations, Seizing the Opportunity to Learn from Past Crisis. And our speakers for today are David Stokes and Julia Wigton. So welcome, over to you guys. Thank you, thank you, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming along to our talk. Um, yep, cyber crash investigations is what we're talking about today. Uh, we'll do some quick introductions. So my name's Julia, I'm a senior manager at PwC Australia. Um, and I've actually had a bit of an unconventional background. So before I came into cyber, uh, I worked in comms and law, but don't hold that against me, please. I'm um, on the right path now. Uh, now I focus on incident readiness, response and recovery. So what I look at is kind of end-to-end -end helping organisations prepare for, respond to and then recover from cyber incidents, doing things like tabletop exercises, um, desktop simulations, uh, all the way through to kind of post-incident reviews and reporting. Um, and the thing I love most about what we do and what we get to do is the investigative element and I think the kind of, I study journalism as well and the, the legal element really ties in well so um, I love trawling through the wreckage of bad things that happen so hopefully we can learn some things today. I'll hand you over to my co-pilot Dave. Big true crime fan as well I think. Um, so my name's David Stocks, I work with Julia at PwC Australia. Um, my background is a bit more of a traditional technology uh, background blended in with some international relations and politics, um, which has always sort of been a bit of a side interest to me. Um, I've done a few things in security. I'm a failed pen tester. I tried it for a little bit. I wasn't very good. Didn't, I wasn't very patient. Um, I then sort of moved into security strategy before sort of finding my passion in um, incident readiness, response and recovery. Um, the thing that I really enjoy about doing what we do is helping people out during, during the middle of a cyber crisis. It's, um, really energising, I think, to, to help people through those kind of circumstances, particularly when they're sort of fresh for people and they've not been in that sort of situation before. Over to you, Captain. Thank you. All right, so before we take off today, I'll talk through what we're going to cover. Um, you'll notice there's a strong aviation theme, and the reason for that is we're really quite taken with the way the aviation industry um, investigates and reports on crashes that happen. Um, you know, understanding what the root cause of a crash m might be and then providing some safety recommendations. Um, we think that's a pretty good approach and it should probably be taken more for cyber attacks. And we know that you've made some inroads here in the US, um, but we're hoping that we'll be able to share some lessons learned and contribute to that through uh, some of the black boxes that we've had the opportunity to open during our, our work. And we have, we've had a really good opportunity to investigate some of Australia's most significant cyber attacks in the last few years um, for a big range of clients and organisations across different industries, so public and private sector, um, all kinds of shapes, sizes and maturities of organisations and despite all that variety there are a few things that pop up time and time again and we started noticing some themes and we thought it'd be kind of good to shine a light on some of those themes and maybe it'd make people go away and, and look a bit harder into the things that you've got in your organisations or with your clients and you can suggest ways to build resilience that you may not have thought of before. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're here to do. And what we're going to do is talk through it in three different stages. So how to prevent a cyber crisis or, or try to do that. And that's our kind of pre-flight check before takeoff. Um, when you're in flight and something goes wrong, how to do some damage control and minimize the impact if you come up against that. And then how you can best respond after the crash. So picking up the pieces of the wreckage. So if we're all ready for takeoff, I'll ask you to fasten your seatbelts and I'll hand over to Dave to get started. And I forgot to mention, these are our views and not those of our employer. So thank you. Thank you for that, Captain. Um, you know, keen to get rolling. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to run some pre-flight checks uh, before we take off. So we're going to get straight into that. And I'll start off with multi-factor authentication and password management. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, we're at a security talk. We're talking about MFA. You know, we, of course we know we should have MFA. Everyone knows we should have MFA. We've been talking about this for years and years and years and years. And we have. Um, you know, it's not a particularly new thing to say, but we're not really saying have MFA. We know that everyone either has it or, or is trying to, to, to get there. I think more what we're saying is that what we've seen in the, in, the, in the cyber crashes that we've 
come across is that it's often inconsistent. So it's on some things. Maybe it's on most things. Maybe it's on your VPN. Maybe it's on your you know, remote desktop services and um, all these other uh, remote access mechanisms, but it may not be on everything. Maybe it's not on that one development environment that a third party is logging into, or you have one particular service provider that it was really complex and they said it was going to be really hard to try and get MFA working, so you've got some sort of exception policy for them and you know it's IP whitelisted or you've got some other control there. But it's, it's inconsistent, um, and I think that often causes uh, cyber incidents. Uh, that's certainly been the experience of what, of, of what we've seen. The other sort of thing that we've seen in this space is that it's enabled and lots of users use MFA, but it's not enforced. Um, so there are some users who don't have to use it and those users present a window into an, or in, into an organization. Um, weaknesses in conditional access policies. Often conditional access policies will be used to try and provide um, you know, a balance between usability and security and, and that's a good thing. But sometimes we set them up in ways that um, leave too much room for uh, threat actors to take advantage of. So it's not have MFA. Of course, everyone knows that we should have MFA. It's, it's about looking in your organization for what those, what, what, the, what, are the, what are the bounds of your MFA policy? You know, where are the different environments where you have this, where it applies? And, and what are the weaknesses that someone might be able to exploit? On password management, uh, it's about storing keys and passwords in, in, in plain text. That's the sort of thing that we've seen time and time again um, causing problems. And it's most common um, in, um, in code, looking uh, and finding sort of clear text APIs in, in code. That seems to be a really common thing and it allows threat actors to escalate their privileges, gain access to new applications when they uh, break into an environment and they're rummaging around trying to extend their access. Um, identity and access management, um, the, the sort of key themes here that we seem to see are that there are too many domain administrators doing more than just domain administrator things. Um, I'm sure that's a, a common sort of thing that uh, a lot of you would have experienced as well. Um, but domain admins should really be focused on just doing domain administration. They don't need to be server admins. Um, and uh, when you do that, you increase the, the risk that someone's able to escalate privileges really easily or quickly when they're hunting around an environment. Um, there's not enough use of the protected user group. Um, Microsoft provides a, a lovely way for you to try and protect some of those accounts, um, but we don't see it used enough. And that's you know, particularly the case in sort of older environments you know, that are kind of typical in large organizations where you, know, you might be running off an older Active Directory functional level you know, this is often still an option that's supported, but it's not one that's often sort of taken up or extended or used as much as it could be, and it, and it really provides some protections there. Um, the last one under this is, is around semi-trusted user groups. So if you think you're an organisation where you have a, a really large contractor base, or you, perhaps you have a vendor with a large pool of users who are providing a service to you, um, or maybe you're a school and you have a bunch of, you know, trusted teachers and a bunch of semi-trusted students, um, who are all trying to break into the network. I know I was when I was at school. Um, if you have that sort of semi-trusted user group, what we've seen sort of time and time again is they actually have a very similar level of trust as the rest of the employee base or the rest of the user base, and maybe one that's not actually appropriate for the level of risk that they present. Now, I know we're all sort of working towards having no trust whatsoever and strongly authenticating everything, but in large organisations, you know, we're not really there yet. Um, on patching and vulnerability management, Again, it's a similar sort of thing to the uh, MFA front. We're not saying don't have MFA. Uh, we're, we're not saying you need MFA. Uh, we've got some fluffy dice. Uh, we had a uh, an outrageous speaker request for a pair of fuzzy dice oh. to hang off the front of the uh, excellent microphone. No, thank you for that. That's, uh, no, much appreciated. Uh, thank you. And, uh, we also had a request for some novelty glasses, so I'm going to get some audience participation. <laughs> Is this what you asked for? Well, you, uh, <laughs> anyone willing to wear some of these and stare back at them? <laughs> thank, thank you. That's, uh, that's going to make you all far less intimidating. <laughs> that is, uh, that, that's fantastic, and I'm, I couldn't be happier. Uh, I couldn't be happier. Uh, back to patching. Obviously, <laughs> that was very distracting, but, but I'm here for it. Um, Back to patching, I think the, the focus is definitely on your riskiest assets. We're not saying, you know, patch everything. Obviously, everyone knows that everything needs to be patched all the time and we do it as much as we can. But in any organization, it's a question of allocation of resources. 
Um, we we know that there's only so many people and and uh, so many teams available to go and um, get things patched. So it's about focusing on the most risky assets. 48 hours for a critical patch across the board sounds great, but like your VPN needs to be patched within a couple of hours, not within not within a couple of days. And uh, for other services, things might be able to wait a little bit longer. Um, don't let over-engineered change control get in the way. You know, we've seen cases where there would have been a patch applied, but it needed to go through a change approval process that had like 11 approvers on it. And the, you know, the 10th person said, nah, like, or wasn't, it wasn't there, it was on holiday, and the change failed because you had too many approvers. So don't let that sort of over-engineered change control get in the way. Or if you are finding that it is the case, find out who's the blocker um, and, and start reporting those names. Um, lots of good work is undone by running end-of-life platforms and applications. Um, it seems to be a really common theme that uh, you're always running into, oh yeah, but we do have that one server, 2008 server, you know, that's, that's sitting there and, you know, we've got it wrapped in wool as best we can, but often it can be the thing that gets you, you you're done over. Um, lastly on this point, making responsibility for patching clear, clear. So often we found that questions about who's patching middleware or who's looking after end user applications on servers, they, they're sort of like middle ground in terms of who's actually responsible for them within an organization. It's not, it's not the Wintel team and it's not the Unix team and it's not the end user application team. So, so who's responsible for those things? Trying to work that out and make sure that there's clear accountability for it, really important. Um, and lastly, on the pre-takeoff checks front, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some third party risk management um, sort of items that seem to crop up. And uh, really that goes to a little bit too much trust with data exchange. Um, you might often know what a third party has in terms of the controls that they have uh, um, imp implemented. You'll often ask in your third party, you know, assurance requests, you know, what controls do you have in place? Um, you know, and, and here, are all, here are all our controls, which of these do you have? Or maybe they'll produce a third party report for you that, that's sort of an industry standard one. Um, but you might not understand the processes they use. Where does data actually go in their organization when it's your data? So taking the time to sort of understand that is really important. And lastly, um, making sure that the contractual framework that you have with that third party gives you the room to have good security conversations and, and baselines. Make sure that if you've got a contract that's been going for 10 years, has your security risk appetite changed in those 10 years? Then you probably, if it has, then you probably need to have another conversation. Um, so with that, I'll move into a, a bit of a case study um, after this short water break. So I want to talk about an organisation um, that about a year ago uh, experienced an incident and they thought that they had MFA in place, but um, a threat actor got a hold of some credentials. Um, we don't know how that happened, like they could have been sold, they could have been reused, um, they could have been fished or malware on a device or whatever. We, we don't know where the, <laughs> where the threat actor got the credit from. But they did um, and there was this successful logon. Um, the, the threat actor was able to log into an M365 environment, they were able to access email, SharePoint, all that sort of stuff. And the organisation had set up M365 um, to enrol users into MFA. And, but, but MFA wasn't strictly enforced, so it was enabled but it wasn't enforced. And what that meant was um, there was a whole group of users, um, executive users, all of the IT team who were logging in every day with MFA. And there was just this sort of like subtle conscious feeling that everyone had, which was, oh yeah, we've got MFA, we've got MFA in place. Um, you know, unless you're looking at those actual conditional access policies and actual, um, and actual MFA enrolment policies, then you're not going to know necessarily that, well, there were some user groups who weren't on that policy and there were some user groups that weren't in this conditional access policy, therefore, there's a set of users that actually aren't challenged with MFA at all, in any circumstance. Um, and, and what that meant was that there were some accounts that were able to log in without MFA, such as this user. So that when the threat actor managed to land on this user's credentials, they were actually able to get into that environment, start accessing email, and um, actually caused a business email compromise attack. So it's really important to try and make sure that you know, you look for those gaps in MFA policies, you look for where there might be weaknesses, where on the surface it looks like there is a policy. And with that, I think we are ready for takeoff. Um, and I'm going to pass over to my co captain to get us into the air. It's very funny looking out at those glasses, I really appreciate that. Um, okay, we're up and we're 
In the air, so let's talk about damage control. So if you're in the air and you notice that things are looking a bit dodgy or there's lights going off and you're not quite sure what's happening, um, these are some of the things we see that organisations either do or fail to do that uh, can either increase or mitigate the damage that they face as a result of these cyber attacks that we've responded to. So the first one is monitoring and detection. Um, and what we see time and time again is despite people having kind of all the bells and whistles and the shiny tools that you need and uh, outsourced socks that cost a fortune or internal socks that cost a fortune for that matter, um, there are blind spots and there are overlaps and there are things that just remain unseen until someone gets in and then it's too late. Um, and what we see as well is people are paying an absolute fortune for all these things and it's like, you know, frontline, you all need it, but you haven't actually tested, uh, put it in practice and put it to the test and, you know, red teaming is such a huge element in that and just making sure that you've actually put it to the test with some weird and wonderful um, situations and made sure that it's going to perform for you. Um, the other thing is alert fatigue. So uh, I'm sure you've all come across this, but we've dealt with organizations who had the alerts, they were right in front of them, but they were sitting amongst kind of 50, 60, 70 other alerts that they were getting daily that were false positives. And what that meant was they were ignored and unfortunately the, the whole thing was rendered, re rendered useless because everyone was a bit complacent at that point and no one picked it up. Um, the other thing is if you do have an outsourced sock that you're working with, uh, we often see that the escalation paths in are unclear, especially if that outsourced sock hasn't come up against something that's really cause for concern before. Um, one organisation we helped respond to an incident, their outsourced sock uh, escalated uh, a pretty, um, pretty damaging <laughs> critical alert through to the service desk instead of the cyber team. So it sat with the service desk for two, three days um, untouched when it should have been kind of picked up and really handled with a great deal of urgency. So there's some of the kind of pitfalls we see in the monitoring and detection space. Um, data management makes me want to pull my hair out. It is the one thing that people don't tend to like do well until it's really too late. Um, basically what we see is there's always, always a whole heap of data that doesn't need to be there that's there and it kind of amplifies the effect of an incident by m you know, multiple times and I don't know if anyone went to Christina Liu's talk yesterday about not actually collecting data that you don't need um, but I think we're a bit behind the eight ball in that sense and a lot of organisations are only just changing their data management strategies to kind of keep up with that, with that approach but when we come in after an incident, it's amazing how many times organisations don't actually know what they have. So the first time they're doing data discovery is during an incident response. And what that means is your place, you, you've got to like increase your team by a factor of 10 to kind of do all this data analysis and trawl through a whole bunch of unstructured data, which can go back years and decades even. Um, it introduces all these new, you know, legal and privacy elements that you wouldn't otherwise need to deal with and, you know, the whole place is crawling with lawyers and no one wants that and it's just a nightmare. So, um, the other thing we see is people using the wrong systems and the wrong um, applications to store and process data and a lot of it you wouldn't kind of think about until it's too late but um, not using file repositories as a dedicated file storage um, place is, is a nightmare because if you're having data pass through things like um, email, email or file servers or things like that and it's not regularly cleaned up, um, that can be absolute chaos if, you know, one of your mailboxes gets popped and that person has delegated access to someone they shouldn't or someone who's pretty important and, um, yeah, it, it, the impacts can be absolutely catastrophic if data management isn't done right. Um, network segmentation. Expensive, everyone knows you should do it. Um, it doesn't need to be cutting edge, like micro segmentation. Uh, what we see is that any kind of good controls that separate edge networks from internal networks are worth their weight in gold. Um, not only for containment, obviously, so during a response and being able to shut things off without massive downstream impacts, um, but also so that the threat actor doesn't have just the easiest time in the world getting across your whole environment, um, getting the keys to the kingdom and being able to do more damage. So uh, a quick case study. Uh, we recently looked at an incident that was a double extortion ransomware attack. Um, the threat actor had get, gained access to this organisation through a VPN vulnerability and then escalated their privileges through to domain admin. So 
bad time for all, um, but the threat actor then went looking for data and they found an absolute gold mine in one of the organization's file servers. Um, what they found was customer records for customers that hadn't been involved in that organization for 10, 15 years, um, which led to some very awkward conversations and apologies about why they were actually holding onto that data after all this time. Um, lots of identity documents. Uh, I don't know about in the US, but in Australia, we have a few identity documents where the numbers don't change, even if the card changes. So some of these were kind of 10 years old, had been collecting, collected during the KYC process, and then just sat there on this file server for over a decade. Um, and the cost of having to kind of engage ID support and help people replace those documents obviously increases the impact by a lot. Um, they also had penetration testing reports in there and all kinds of kind of operationally sensitive documents that might have been useful for the threat actor given the position they were in. Um, and the real doozy, unfair dismissal and workplace behaviour complaints, which no one wants to see anywhere other than locked up in a safe somewhere. Um, that caused them a lot of grief. And, and the last thing was a lot of the staff had over the course of their employment um, kept backups of their personal files from their laptop onto this file server. And so all of a sudden you're dealing with not just the exposure of your corporate data, but a whole bunch of people's personal data. Uh, so that was a bit of a nightmare and it meant that, you know, what could have, it was already a bad time, right? It's a double extortion ransomware attack, but it just increased the scale of the impact just phenomenally. And it, and it in terms of cost in dollar sense and also the reputational damage, it was just wild. So um, why did they have all this data there? They didn't need to, they didn't know they did, or kind of everyone had dusted their hands and not been looking into what was there, um, but it caused them real trouble. So please avoid that if you can. Uh, the captain has just walked away and crashed the plane. Uh, so we are going to pick up the pieces um, now that that's all happened. Uh, all a bit alarming. But we're going to talk about sort of some of those key things that you can do after the plane has crashed, after there's a crisis actually happening. What is it that we can do to try and um, minimise the damage as best we can um, and uh, just sort of pick ourselves back up as, as quickly as we possibly can? Um, and one of the first things that you can do, you know, if you have this well in advance, is have some sort of containment plan. When we talk about, when we sort of go into organisations afterwards and we try and um, help them respond to a large cyber crisis. It seems like a lot of the time there's not that initial containment plan that tells them here are our options to contain an incident at different levels. So, you know, often there'll be some sort of understanding about containing a single endpoint. You know, the SOC will know we can turn off uh, a, a single um, workstation most of the time. But sometimes it gets a bit fuzzy if it's an executive and they're like, oh, I'm not sure if I can just go and turn off the CEO's computer like that. Maybe maybe there's a little bit of hesitation there. But it gets a little bit more complicated when it's like, you know, um, a, a server running an important application for a business or um, a whole environment um, or maybe even disconnecting the internet for a whole organisation. Um, the different containment steps that you can take at each layer um, there's not necessarily a good understanding of what the impact of those decisions might be. What, like, what, what does that mean for your organisation? What does disconnecting from the internet mean? If an organisation doesn't know what that means in advance, it means that when they're contemplating the decision, they have to think about what all those impacts are. And that might slow down their decision making. And it, it's not a hypothetical here, it does slow down the decision making. And I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a case study in a little bit. But, um, you know, the lessons I'd say from, from this particular one is have some sort of containment plan that's really clear on who can make these decisions at what level. So, you know, who can isolate a single workstation? Who can isolate a server that's going to knock out a whole application? Um, what about disconnecting from the internet? Who's the right person for that? And they can be different people, but don't over-escalate it. Don't make it the CEO for all of these things um, because uh, it'll just take too long to try and make a speedy decision and sometimes a really quick containment decision can save a huge amount of pain later on. Um, have enough people who know how to enact your plans. It's no good having a containment plan if it relies on, you know, uh, two key people from IT who happen to be away and no one else knows how to, you know, disconnect the internet in a reliable way. Um, and then you have someone running in and pulling random cables or, uh, or something like that and you, you end up in a state that you're not expecting. So that's containment. Business continuity and recovery, the number one issue in this space is that organisations, when they set up business continuity, they're often thinking in terms of, well, 
you know, I have this contract with IT, and it says that the SLA for this application to come back up again should it have any sort of outage is four hours, or maybe it's 24 hours. But it, it, it's based on, you know, the restore time objectives that they've got, you know, they've got a, you know, if they're using metal ratings for applications, maybe they've got a gold or a silver or, or a platinum application, and everything supporting it will be back up within 24 hours. So the business continuity that the business needs to enact only needs to go for that long. And time and time again, when we go looking at them, these business continuity plans only are able to cover that kind of distance. They're not able to do any sort of manual processing after that. And what that means is that um, when there's a large cyber crisis, like a ransomware attack where things might be down for at least a few days and probably weeks, sometimes many weeks, then organisations aren't actually well set up to do anything about it. Um, they're, they're having to invent these processes on the fly. They have to figure out you know, at what rate they can do stuff, how, how they go about doing things manually. Um, there's, they're trying to figure out the stuff on the fly. Whereas if you can in advance think about and test what your business continuity is that's going to last you a week or two weeks, then you're in a much better place should you actually have to do that. You know what you're going to prioritise. You know what sort of processes you're going to prioritise. You know what rate of efficiency you're going to achieve and therefore what things might have to wait. Sorry, Captain, I'll just point out the front of our plane is actually shaved off. So where were those business continuity plans stored? Oh, that's a good were they point. Up in the Cockpit? That's true. If the uh, if, if these plans were up in the cockpit, up in the cockpit, we would uh, we'd be in real strife in this situation. Um, so it's really important to store those business continuity plans um, somewhere that you're going to be able to access in the case of an incident. Don't just save it on your SharePoint. It's got to be in a different platform or printed out and maybe printed out in a couple of places so that it's accessible. Good point. This is why there's two captains. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of on the business continuity front. The last sort of point there. Um, on the recovery side of things is the capacity to restore things in bulk. It's often quite limited. Um, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about, uh, as organisations, how we bring back a lot of things all at once. We think about sort of single applications a lot of the time or, or, or a set of infrastructure, but not necessarily how quickly would we be able to restore everything all at once. Um, we should at least know that number, right? If it turns out it's a couple of weeks because that's how fast our backup infrastructure would take to restore everything. With everything going well, which it won't, um, if that's a couple of weeks, that's, that's a question that should be put to management to make a decision on, is that acceptable? Are we okay with that? Can we prioritise the stuff that's really important to us in the first half of that, that and that's going to be okay? Will that business continuity last that long? These are the kind of decisions I think we need to, to be making. Um, and also considering the prioritisation in, and interdependencies. So, um, you know, within a, within a metal rating, within sort of platinum applications and gold applications and silver applications, you know, you might still have 50 applications. So which of those is more important than the others? Because you will actually have to sequence them if you have to bring them all back at once. Uh, so having some thinking within those groups and also understanding the interdependencies. Maybe there's some, you know, bronze rated um, service uh, that, that by itself is bronze, but it has interdependencies that are, um, it, it's, uh, it has sort of gold applications that depend on it. So we need to sort of think about those kind of dependencies as well and make sure that we're factoring that into our recovery plans. On crisis management, um, I'd say there's a bit of complacency uh, amongst executive teams because of COVID. You'll often go to organisations and they'll say, oh, we've run a bunch of, we've, we've, we're very fresh from running a bunch of crisis stuff. We met regularly during COVID and um, we're running our crisis management team. Um, and, and that's true that some organisations have had the opportunity to sort of go through their crisis management plans a little bit more recently than they, they used to before the pandemic, but it doesn't necessarily cater to the kinds of people that they would need to draw in if they were dealing with a cyber incident um, or the kind of speed that they might need to move at. Um, so sort of rejecting some of that complacency is, um, is good in a, in a sort of respectful way. Um, considering fatigue, uh, is really important during crisis. Everyone's going to have to work long hours during a cyber crisis. Um, you know, we can't sort of stick to that nine to five, and that's okay because when your organisation goes through something, everyone's really committed to try and get that organisation through the other side. Um, but that only lasts so long. You know, you can do that for uh, you know 48 hours, 96 hours, but af after a week, um, you know, you're going to start to run into tension with people. You know, feeling like they're trading off their their families and their and their personal well-being with the organisation, and you want to avoid getting into that situation. One, because you care for your employees, but also because 
um, people will leave. People will switch off, or they'll or they'll overload and they'll just crash, and they'll and, and they'll be pushed aside at the worst moment. So having redundancy in people and um, and alternates that people can go to, that's really important in that sort of you know after the first 48 hours of, of an incident. Uh, escalating really quickly um, is important, not just to unlock support from an executive management team, but also uh, and, and other parts of the business, but also. Um, from insurers and other third parties that you might have available to, to help you in a, in a crisis situation. And, and just to mention that, um, escalating not for decision making, but just more mm. of a notification. So we talked about before not escalating too much, but this is escalating to unlock support for a decision you've already made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. Um, on the privacy and regulatory side, um, just to sort of finish off with before I go into a case study, Julie mentioned before, uh, data analysis is really hard. The amount of data that people have uh, and, and unstructured data that people have floating about means that the data analysis task to try and figure out what was impacted can be so incredibly hard. It is, it is hard to overstate how much of a difference it can make. It can drastically increase the uh, expense, time, um, and, and sort of external headaches in, um, in a response when you have all of this personal data floating around or just unstructured data that you don't know. Maybe it has personal data, maybe it doesn't. The potential for it means that you're going to spend a huge amount of time sort of focused on this stream that you don't need um, or you need less of. But because data analysis is really complex, um, know who's going to do that for you. Do you have a you know, team within your organisation that's going to be able to do that for you? Is it something that um, you can rely on parts of the business who are going to understand the data really well um, to be able to support you with? Or is there someone that you've got to, to help you with those kind of things outside your organisation? Does your insurer have someone on tap? Whatever it might be. Um, knowing your privacy obligations in advance is really important, um, particularly if you're a multinational and you're dealing with different territories around the, around the globe, all those different privacy obligations you might have. Knowing what kind of uh, regulators you need to get in contact with, with what information and what time frame you need to give them a heads up on. Some of those time frames have gotten really short um, over the last few years as regulators have tried to sort of get closer to the pulse of these kinds of incidents. Um, lastly, having a comms plan for those sort of internal and external stakeholders. Um, you know, I, I know from sort of quite personal experience that crafting some of those communications about what happened in the wake of an incident um, and everyone feeling really comfortable with the language can take a really long time. People will still tweak, tweak it, even if they've got a template, but a template with some agreed language is going to um, you know, give you a massive head start to sort of getting um, your, your customers, your corporate customers or your end consumers um, some comfort. So um, I will move on to our final case study, um, which is about an organisation that was in this sort of over-escalation situation. Um, what happened was the organisation's SOC uh, identified a suspected intrusion and it was based on an impossible travel alert. So they, this is for a single user account, um, a single login, but it was this impossible travel situation. The organisation hadn't blocked that, um, but they did get alerts about it and their SOC was looking at it. Um, the, the user was a finance executive, it wasn't unusual for them to travel, um, and uh, there was some doubt about whether the alert was legitimate or not. Um, obviously the, the time between the two logins made them think, well, you know, maybe this is a legitimate alert, but they were really concerned about the impact of disabling the account if they went ahead and just did it. So um, the, the SOC sort of looked into it further. Uh, they identified that the user account had um, attempted to log into an application server. Now, that, that, uh, that attempt failed, so they weren't able to successfully log into the thing. They didn't have the privileges to do so. But they saw the attempt and they went, OK, this is almost certainly... Um, uh, suspect, well, this is almost certainly an illegitimate logon. There's probably someone else with these creds. And um, they, they thought they were going to disable the account. They went to the CISO and said, hey, like, we want to go and disable this account. Uh, it's not, not a huge organisation, but like, so they went to the CISO. They, went, they said, we're going to disable this account. CISO has a look, goes through all the data themselves um, and, and validates the decision. Yep, let's shut it off. They shut off the account. But in the time that this took, the threat actor had gained access to other systems and, um, and other accounts while they were, like, in the time this decision-making took. So um, the threat actor had placed 
uh, some cobalt strike beacons on some systems as well. The threat, the, the SOC picked up on a malware alert from one of the servers uh, that was impacted um, by, the, by the cobalt strike beacon. And they also saw some of these other um, attempts at access to um, other systems. So they'd look, they'd, they'd gone around and they've realized that things are starting to look a bit out of containment. They might have something a bit widespread that, uh, that they aren't truly in, in, um, in control of. Their recommendation was actually to disconnect from the internet. They didn't know what else they could do in that sort of situation. It felt like it had jumped their containment lines. And, and in truth, it had. Um, so the, the, they took that to the CISO. CISO immediately turns around and, and takes it to the, to the CEO who convened an executive meeting uh, 90 minutes later to talk about what the impacts of disconnecting the internet would look like for that organization. Um, and you know they, they talk about it for about 45 minutes. They made the decision to disconnect the internet. But again, in that time window that they took to make that decision, uh, the, um, the threat actor had managed to make off with some data. So uh, you know, we think that they were trying to go through a double extortion ransomware attack, and they were going to unleash ransomware. So the, the disconnection from the internet and the C2 probably saved them from ransomware. But, it, but it, uh, if it had been done earlier, it might have saved them from some data exfiltration. Um, so it's just a really good example of if you have some of that containment plan in advance, you know what the impacts of disconnecting are going to be. You have someone empowered like the CISO who can say, yes, we're going to do this. Um, you might arrive at sort of a better outcome for, for your organization. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to pass over to my co-captain to uh, wrap things up. Thank you for handling the chaos, Dave. Um, as someone who's flown a long way to be here, I'm quite nervous about my journey home now, but thank you. Um, so to wrap up the talk, um, I just wanted to cover off a few key points. So you might have noticed that we're not talking about a whole bunch of new tools here. And I think the, the number one lesson is you don't need all the bells and whistles. A lot of the organizations we've worked with who've responded to these cyber crises the best aren't necessarily the people who've invested the most money in their security. You know, they're people who have um, thought about their practices and processes and tested things out and know their organization really well. So by no means is this a go out and buy the best EDR tools or pay a fortune for an outsourced stock. If you've got those things, great, but just make sure they're working for you as best that they can. Um, damage control almost always comes down to data management in our experience. So uh, yeah, like eight times out of 10, the organizations we've worked with who've had a horrible time in the months following an incident um, are dealing with the, the data breach element. And it's something that you know, very few people are specialized in doing that data analysis. And yeah, as Dave said, you can't overstate the amount of time and energy it takes and the complexity of actually going through something like that with a data set that no one's actually familiar with. So uh, yeah, try and get that under control and you'll help yourself in the event that touch wood, you have an incident, you don't have an incident. <laughs> um, uh, BCPs are almost never fit for a cyber crisis purpose, so make sure they're not relating to one application that's experiencing one outage. They're actually scalable to something like a ransomware attack. And if they're sitting in a drawer dusty somewhere, um, make everyone get them out and have a look and kind of look at them collectively and see if they would actually function the way that you intend them to function in an extended outage. And link together. And link together. Yeah, very good point. They need to work together. Um, and finally, a little preparation goes a long way. So Dave talked about this, but any organization you can do beforehand to get some pre-agreement from the people who need to sign off on really key decisions that are going to take them a while in the moment and in the heat of the moment um, can really help out in the long run. And any of that kind of pre-agreement on messaging principles, if you're talking about public statements or containment actions and people being kind of familiar with the impacts of different containment level um, decisions um, goes a long way. Also uh, practicing, and I would say that, but making sure you're exercising your executive and exercising your tech teams and exercising with your external SOC and making sure that everyone's worked together before um, makes it a lot easier, obviously, if, if everything does uh, fall in a big heap. So thank you for flying with us. That was the end of our talk. Um, uh, we hope you join us again. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. If there are any questions, we're happy to take them now. Um, and we've got our LinkedIn links up on the screen. So yeah, thanks, everyone. And here we go. <laughs> I, I really like planes. <laughs>
test, test. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Um, I'm in agreement with the preconditioning, being able to take down the internet for a predetermined amount of time, figuring out which of the critical pieces of the business and how you would still let them through if they weren't part of the scope. Um, it gives us a lot of freedom to do things that we need to do to, as you said, to protect the organization. So uh, that, that one's helped a lot. So I definitely agree. Yeah, I think another thing we've seen is people expect their executive to make certain decisions because they know them quite well, especially in smaller organizations. Um, but when it's a crisis situation, there might be one person who vehemently disagrees with the prospect of taking everything offline and shutting down your operations or, you know, if you're dealing with a ransomware attack, um, the concept of paying a ransom. Like, people just come out of the woodwork and have these really strong views that they're not willing to be swayed on. And it's better to find that out before you're in... The absolute shit, to put it Yeah. We have the same conversation about ransomware. If we're going to pay it, we have a lot of prep work to do now. <laughs> exactly. If we're not going to pay it, great. Yeah. And we'll deal with that. And our executive said, no, we're not going to pay it. Now, we have a new CEO, so we have to go and we've got to open the box again. <laughs> yeah, we got to open that same box again, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or uh, contributions? Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, it's more of a comment, not a question. Uh, I heard this quote. I can't remember, unfortunately, who said it, but... Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Can you speak? Ah, oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the talk. I, I have a more of a comment than a question. Uh, I can't remember who said it, but there is a saying that uh, from attacker standpoint, every decision is technical, and from a defender standpoint, every decision is political. Hmm. Yeah, very good. That's pretty it, spot on. It, it does feel like that sometimes, <laughs> yeah, particularly when, when, uh, when you know, you're hearing one of these topics get debated in a, in a long meeting, when, uh, when you know a decision should just be made. Yeah. Um, this is a question. Uh, what kinds of data management techniques or tools have you seen work well, like especially at a relatively small organization that doesn't have a lot of infrastructure? Uh, I, I'll, I'll kick off and then maybe Julie, you can add in. But I think um, a really key one is using applications that are meant to do the job. Um, so like, don't use SharePoint or email for processing a bunch of personal information. Um, don't sort of flow some of that, like don't send notifications with all the text into email. Don't, don't sort of like have all of these reports on, land on SharePoint that have like all of this personal information in it. Um, try and use a tool that's actually meant to capture that information, store it securely through its whole life cycle. The minute you sort of and, you know, exit outside a controlled process. I think that's where you know we've seen organisations land into trouble. Yeah, I'd add um, most of the organisations we've helped through a data breach actually have data retention and destruction policies, mm. but no one's seen them for years. <laughs> no one actually uses them, and um, again, they're dusty in a drawer somewhere. So I think just making sure if you've got policies and standards, like use them. They're there for a reason. Make sure they kind of align with all the regulatory requirements. But most of all, use them to protect your organisation from that kind of catastrophic impact. Auto archiving too can like save a huge amount of pain. The amount of stuff that just like stays on SharePoint live accessible. It doesn't need to be live accessible, right? Like it can, it can get archived and you can have a process to go and retrieve that data. It just doesn't need to be accessible on the network with a user account or a privileged user account. That doesn't need to be there in a way that it, it is at almost every organization. Any other last questions? No? All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks Enjoy so the rest much. of the